Cochin isn't something to hide behind all the other bottles anymore. Gary McLaughlin and his fellow co-founders of Glendalough Distillery in Wicklow, Ireland, knew it was to be the first spirit that they had to make when establishing Ireland's first craft distillery. If you don't know what it is, then now is your chance to find out. I'm Susan Schwartz, your drinking companion, and this is Lush Life Podcast. Every week, we are inspired to live life one cocktail at a time by the best in the industry. Poaching is the traditional spirit of Ireland, and after years of it being illegal, it's finally out in the open being enjoyed, along with all the other award-winning gin and whiskeys that Glendalough Distillery has created. Come along with me to Wicklow now, the Garden of Ireland, to hear the legend of St. Kevin and how he inspired Gary and his friends even before Glendalough had produced even one drop of spirit. So it was back in 2011, um, my very good friend Barry Gallagher uh, came to me, approached me and asked me to have a look at something. Um, but let's rewind a little bit before I, I tell you I what, was just what, I, lo- say what that. I looked at. You got to go back. Yeah, yeah, it. yeah. So myself and Barry went to kindergarten or play school together. Right. So literally from the age of four, then we went to same preschool, same, same, same senior school. And at 18, we parted ways and he went on to uh, to college and one, one college I went to another, but um, we're very good friends. After college, a gang of us went to Australia for like a gap year. Myself and Barry went, we ended up traveling back through Asia together for three months. So I know Barry pretty well. Um, so yeah, we go way back. Um, so when he says, I want you to do something. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. When he, he said, would you have a look at this? And uh, I was like, yeah, of course. So Basically, when he when he said that back in 2011, he was a drinks analyst with a stockbroking firm. So his job was to tell the the brokers what to invest in. You know, invest in Perno, don't invest in Diageo this oh. month. Because so he knew the business of drinks. Mm-hmm. And I was a uh, managing director of an advertising agency. So I had worked on Jemison for five or six years while they really were ramping up in the middle of the noughties. Um, and I worked on, I always gravitated towards booze brands for whatever reason. I was just uh, going to ask that. How come? How did you end up? You can tell a great Jameson's. story. You can tell a great story with, um, from a communications and advertising point of view with, with, with drinks brands. It's just, there's, there's lots of rich history and just, there's just lots of places you can go with a drinks brand. So I worked on beers, worked on, on spirits and, and lots of fun, as well as many, many other brands, PlayStation and, you know, some great, great, great international uh, brands. Were you a lover of one specific spirit at that time? Um, truth be told, I got into whiskey when I started working for Jamison. So I was mid, mid noughties. Um, up until then, I was like, mm, I could give or take whiskey. But then I got really learned to appreciate it, you know, because literally if you're working on it for five, six years, you go into events. I worked on their uh, special reserve range, you know, which is like their ultimately, you know, they're, they're, they're seriously good whiskey. So, yeah, I learned to appreciate a good whiskey. So, so you know, um, so I do love whiskey. I absolutely adore whiskey now. And I've got to really love really like gin as well especially the craft of gin and i'm quite involved in in that and 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 how how we make it so so yeah do i have a particular go-to i'd probably drink more g and t's than i would a whiskey but i appreciate whiskey probably a bit more you know at the end of night or in a special occasion that type of thing so so um but going back to uh sort of the origins and how we all met so so barry barry came to me uh he had had this idea uh, he had already briefed a design agency, but what he got back from you know the the, the drawings, the 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 renders, the the creative, he didn't really like too much. He put it in front of me, and I said, "Yeah, that's okay, <laughs> being nice." <laughs> and he said, "Well, look, could you do a better job?" I said, yeah, of course I could, and you know this is my thing. So I very quickly pulled uh, uh, an ex creative director friend of mine, so who we worked together on Jemison um, before. And Kev Keenan is his name, so I pulled him in, and he's you know he's he, he is like me, gravitated towards drinks brands, and uh, he's he, he's a huge amount of experience with drinks brands. So the two of us sort of were set up as the marketing team, and Barry and I should mention Brian Fagan as well, the other the other director. They both worked in Davies together. It was both their brainchild. So 
those the the the, the stockbrokers came to the marketeers and we 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 sat down and, and, and we 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 started uh, Glendlock, Ireland's first craft distillery. So. Now, what was now? You're going to have to speak for Barry right now. Yeah, yeah. But really, why did he even want to do this? Because he came to you. He already had an idea. Uh-huh. What What did he, you know, conceive, and mm-hmm. why did it come? What did it come out of? So he had to know what was working, what wasn't, from a drinks point of view globally. Mm-hmm. So literally, what What are the trends? what's hot, what's not, what's coming down the line. He had literally just written a white paper on Irish whiskey and its resurgence. And like, you know, go, going back a couple of hundred years, Irish whiskey, at the turn of the last century, Irish whiskey and rum were the two biggest selling drinks globally mm-hmm. because of the British and colonialism and all that. It was brought everywhere, but they were, the you know, so back in the day, Irish whiskey was huge. It was much bigger than Scotch. Um. And for various reasons, you know, I could probably talk to you for an hour about the various, you know, political reasons and, and, and why Irish history had its downfall. But it was resurging again. Mm-hmm. It was coming again. Thanks to Jameson, thanks to I, I, Perna Ricard. They invest a huge amount, or they still are investing a huge amount in their brands, particularly Jameson. And they have paved the way for these, you know, there's 30, close to 40 Irish distilleries now, which is fantastic. But back in 2011, there were three. There were three Irish distilleries making every brand of Irish whiskey out there. Uh, not a lot of people know that. Um, it's crazy to think yeah. that. I it, know. Isn't it? And like wow. bef- before that, there were literally hundreds, nearly thousands. Like at, 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 like at, at one stage in Ireland, pretty much every decent sized town had a distillery. Mm-hmm. Like it was part of who we are. It was part of, it was very much part of where we came from. So when we, the four of us all got together, I'll never forget it. That, that, and he said, that, I'll, well, he'll say, I'll, I want some of that. Yeah. You know, let's, let's see what we yeah. can do. Yeah, so, so like he, he, himself and Brian had, had, had the idea of, of um, you know, they saw a niche in the market. They saw that it was coming again, that there will be, you know, that, that the Jemison and Irish distillers had, 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 um, had sort of poked, had poked the fire. The embers were, you know, it was, it was it, the, the, the Irish whiskey was, was, was becoming great again. And um, yeah, so we were we were ahead of the um, the curve from a sort of small craft distillery point of view. There there weren't any. Mm-hmm. There were big players. There was large distillers. There was you know Bushmills and and and, and there was Cooley, and they're now all you know, all owned by big international corporations. But there was no Irish owned independent distilleries. Mm-hmm. So we saw that as a very much an opportunity for us to do something there. And you know, thanks be to God, you know, it's it's it's. Uh, it's 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 proven to be have been a good uh, good idea, good move because now, when he came to you, mm-hmm. did he already have the idea of calling it Glendalock? Mm-hmm. You know, was that all already in place? It was the idea. Now, to be honest, at the time, it was like we have this name, we think it's great. What do you marketing guys think? My first reaction was, I like it. Um, the only my only thing was okay. Well, it does it sound a little bit Scottish because there's lots of glens yeah. in, in the Scotch, but you know. But then, quite quickly, you know, it's it's one of the big, most visited sites in Ireland uh, from a tourist point of view. Like it's a stunning, you know, you've been there. It's a stunning uh, place. Um, it's where we all went as kids. So the four of founders, like if we ever went for Sunday walks when we were as kids or family were over, that's where we were brought. That's where we brought the family who came, who came over. It's, it's a really, really special place. It's a gorgeous place. So we all have a lot of affinity towards the place itself. And I think the name works, you know, and, um, and as I said, like, I think, you know, after the Guinness storehouse, it's probably the most visited tour, tourist spot. So from a, brand name point of view and recognition point of view you know it it, 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 was, it was really good so we quite quickly uh, moved on from yes that's a good name let's let's stick with it let's go with it and then we really like we delved into the the history behind Glendalock and it just got better and better it was like a snowball it was you know so the guy you see on the front of our bottles now is St. Kevin it's such a great story so he back in the 6th century he was supposed to be the next. So he was. He was next. His father was the king of Leinster. So Ireland split up into four provinces: Leinster, Ulster, Munster, and Connacht. Leinster is where Dublin is. So his dad was the king of Leinster. They lived just outside what, where Dublin is now. And um, he was like, "I do not want to be a king. I am into the outdoors. I'm very spiritual. People, you know, people listen to him. He was quite a learned man. So he decided to abandon all the." 
you know the royalties and all the 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 the, the um, riches and all that, that 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 come with it. And he went into the mountains, into the Dublin mountains, and into Wicklow. And you know, legend has it that he he roamed for seven years until he found the right spot to call home. And he 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 based himself on this beautiful glacial valley, which is Glendalough. Absolutely nothing else there. Glacial Valley, two beautiful lakes, but that's where he called home. As I mentioned, he was quite a learned man and people listened to him. So people found out he had, he had left, he'd gone there and that's where he's based himself. So people slowly but surely came out to Glendalough to listen to the man. And, and over time, it, it, you know, it, it developed into a monastery. So... Um, and and uh, over the years, like it still stands. So that's what's quite amazing. Like from the from the sixth century to today, that round tower is still there. You know, the cathedral is pretty much still there. Okay, the roof's gone, but there's beautiful churches. St Kevin's Kitchen is a stunning, stunning little church that still stands today. Amazing. So at at its height, Glendalough had over two thousand people actually living and and working the land and, and living around it. So it it, it it developed into quite the metropolis. <laughs> um, actually, uh, its nickname was the City of Seven Churches because no more is it a city. <laughs> but it, it, if you look at the... if you if, uh, it, um, they, they built seven churches in this tiny little area uh, in this valley. And if you look at our bottle of seven-year-old, we nod to that fact. So there's oh. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven churches. You don't need Google Maps next time you go. You can just bring a bottle of seven-year-old with you to see where those <laughs> churches are. Um, so now that's, we love to tell stories. Mm. It's our marketing background. So you can see there's so much, there's a lot of richness. There's a lot going on with the story of St. Kevin. And I haven't even told you the best bit. So the reason he's, he looks like he does, hands aloft, you know, in the cruciform um, stance, uh, as more and more people came to Glendalough. He actually, even though he was learned and people listened to him, he didn't like people that much, seemingly. So he used to take off and he'd go from the monastery up to the upper lake and that's where he'd pray, away from everybody. And legend has it, he'd go into the water up to his knees and raise his hands to God uh, in that position. And a blackbird landed in his hand and decided to, oh, look, at this is a nice tree, and <laughs> laid three eggs. And St. Kevin took this as a challenge, you know, it was character, you know. Okay, this bird has laid three eggs in my hand. Can I, can I wait until these eggs hatch? So he, he stood there for 13 days and 13 nights until the eggs hatched. Mm. Uh, and and, and, and the, birds, yeah, the birds fledged the nest. So look, a fable a story. We love it. We absolutely love it because it just says so much about the man, uh, his his character, what he's made from. He, you know, he does things the hard way, um, and we love that. And we li- we lit we literally live by that. We so much so that it's not in our old bottles, but in all our new bottles, are are the two words that define us. Are stand apart. Everything we do, from choosing the barrels. Uh, that our whiskey goes in to making our now our pot still, which I'll tell you about in, in a few moments. To the way we make our gin, how we recruit, how we come up with a design for a T-shirt, how we come up with a label on a bottle, it has to stand apart. Um, so that's you know that's that's sort of the story of Saint Kevin and why he's on every bottle. Um, so, Wait, so yeah. no, I was yeah, going to yeah. say. So let's go back. Uh-huh. All right, a little bit mm-hmm. to. Uh, Barry coming to you with, could you look at this? Uh-huh. Okay, so you saw it. You said, mm, we could do better. You mm-hmm. got your friend Kevin, mm-hmm. not St. Kevin, but Kevin, yeah. mm-hmm. come along. And you had an idea. Mm-hmm. I assume he had an idea, okay, mm-hmm. of what he wanted. Mm-hmm. How did you start putting that into place? What was the first thing that you said, okay, this is what we're going to make. This is what we want to make. You know, what was that kind of the business plan of uh, that, that Barry had originally? From a spirit's point of view, yes. I said, okay, from a yeah, yeah. Point of view. So it all meshed together quite well, especially the Saint because so it's basically our our story, the Saint Kevin story on, on the bottle, and actually our liquid meshed together pretty pretty well, and and that's very much deliberate as well. So the first spirit that was ever, cer- certainly the first spirit that's ever been documented in history, written down, was made by Irish monks back in the sixth century. So that's, that's, that is a very important part of the story I, 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 I omitted. Um, 
So, so everything was happening in the sixth century. Everything was happening in the sixth century. Saint Kevin running away from home. Yeah, (laughs) booze for the first time was invented. A big century. Yeah, huge (laughs) century. So, um, I can't believe I left that point out. But anyway, um, thank you for 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 asking the questions. Um, So, yeah, in monasteries like Glendalough, they had to drink something to warm up. Yeah, (laughs) and. and, and, and so what they would have made back then was a form of putchin. Okay, mm-hmm. so putchin is what we made first. We had to. We had to make this first to be true to ourselves, true to the whole story of St. Kevin. Um, so that's the very first liquid that we made. Putchin is pretty much a, very, a young whiskey. It's an unaged whiskey. It can be made from a number of different things, um, literally from everything from heather, uh, which grows in mountains, to, to a lot of people know it for, for especially in Ireland as a, from, that it comes from putching or sorry from potato um, because potatoes are nice and starchy and they make a nice mash bill and all that but uh, uh, it's renowned and it's sort of notorious putching because it was outlawed in 1661 um, by the British crown because uh, they wanted the Irish to pay tax everybody was making okay, putching they yeah. wanted the Irish to pay tax and the Irish didn't want to pay tax, so uh, the English banned the, 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 the production of putchin. It was only legalized again in, back in 1996. I, I assume someone was making it somewhere. Though. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and it was still, was it still being drunk even Absolutely. up to now? Yeah. Or had it I, lost that favor? It was seen as something on the top shelf in a different type of bottle, like, you know, a soda bottle uh-huh. or whatever that, you know, your grandfather yeah. had. And, you know, <laughs> your grandmother you, mate in the back. Yeah, the back. don't <laughs> touch it, kids, right, you know, right. type thing. And it comes out at parties yeah, blind, or you, wakes exactly. and that type of stuff, you know. So and all, even even like, you know, you'd rub it, rub it on your leg if it had an ache type right. thing. And it was highly, highly, um, you know, very high in alcohol, uh-huh. like, you know, 80, 90 proof or 80, 90 uh, ABV. Uh, 180 right. proof yeah. yeah so you know very very um strong but uh, so it was sort of it because it was outlawed it be- it became this sort of you know this this um drink that people nearly feared it was infamous you know mm-hmm. um so we decided back 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 in the day back in 2011 okay look there's really an opportunity to premiumize putchin you know and make it into something that's you know, it's 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 Irish. It's unique. Um, so that's that's the first thing we did. We started with putching. Um, we we bottled it and um, uh, we, we we launched it with a cocktail competition in Dublin. <gasps> the first ever putching cocktail competition. Um, we got bartenders from all around Ireland, and they were really in- intrigued and interested because you know this is our spirit. This is something that they can play with. It's something very different. And we developed this beautiful little cocktail cookbook with all their, you know, beautiful photography and all that. So that's how we launched how la- launched the brand. Launched it initially in Ireland, and then quite quickly we we went to Boston. So a shipment of putching went across oh the Atlantic yeah. for the first time in many, many, many years. Um, but this time, you know, all legal, all 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 good stuff. We. We, we three different types of butchering actually we did it we did a, a premium which is 40 percent we did a sherry cask which was um finished in sherry cask with a nice um I don't think of any behind the bar a nice um whiskey tint off it and then we did a mountain strength which was a 60 percent abv mm-hmm. uh just you know a nod to the the stronger putching a lot of people would would would, would, would think of when they think of putching uh, today we've we, we we've brought that back just to one sku which is the mountain strength we've brought it down to 55 percent, so 110 proof um it's still a very very it's an important part of who we are and where we came from it's important it's an important liquid to us from a sales point of view it's a bit of a novelty that you know a lot of people might buy it in dublin airport or uh, you know in, in ireland as something to bring home because you can't really get it anywhere else it's not huge for us. It might be two, three percent of global sales, but uh, it's as I said, it's really important. It's important part of a story. It's important, it's important uh, building block of, of 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 the company. So, how long did it take you from idea of creating it mm-hmm. to you know tasting and actually having a product that you think, oh well, I think this tastes like yeah. what it should? About like from when we met in January two thousand and eleven. We I probably get the date wrong, but it was, as in the month wrong, but oh. it, was, it was 2012. So it was, it was the guts of a year to okay. go for, and we all were double jobbing. So we all had our, 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 our main jobs and we did this nights and weekends. Um, so it took about a year, developed the brand, developed the liquid, play with the liquid until we're ha- very happy with it and then launch it. So yeah, I, th- I think it was springtime 2012 mm-hmm. that we uh, that we launched mm-hmm. the Puchin. So yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, 
But I assume that while you're making this, you're thinking other spirits. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Like when we, like when the four of us sat down and talked about what we're going to do, you know, our our actual name is Glendalough Irish Whiskey Limited. That's our official name. We're, you know, so we always Mm -hmm. were had whiskey in mind, but as you know, whiskey has to be rested for or uh, matured for three years and a day before you can call it whiskey. So, um, so yeah, we, we, we were always getting into whiskey and um, gin was more of a, okay, well, why the whiskeys, we were waiting for the whiskey and, and, and that, you know, gin can be made pretty quickly, like, like, like putching. So, so that's the, the putching and the gin. Um, yeah, as I said, they could, they could, they could be made, uh, pretty, pretty, no, it's not overnight. If you really want to, you could do it overnight, but, but, uh, but no, we take a little bit longer. Um, so so yeah, that was that was uh, that was sort of like the origin. That's where it all mm-hmm. that's where it all started. We, from a whiskey point of view, we um, and again very deliberately up up front, we said, okay, there's only three distilleries in Ireland making Irish whiskey. We want we're a premium brand, and we always will be. So we want some nice premium liquid to launch. Uh, we weren't mega funded. We didn't have loads of euros or dollars in the bank accounts, so. We couldn't wait the three and a half, three years to, 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 we didn't want to anyway, wait that, that long to, before we released whiskey. So we, we, we bought parcels of whiskey from Cooley to one of the three uh, mm. distilleries and we, um, to put our own stamp on it, it, the barrel that we finished those whiskeys we bought in became really, really important. The whole stand apart piece. Okay. We need barrels that stand us apart from other whiskeys mm. out there and put our stamp on it. While waiting for our own whiskey to be to be produced or to be to be finished and and and, and matured, so um, so we launched a double barrel whiskey. It's just single grain whiskey, um, aged first in bourbon barrels, first filled bourbon uh, for just over three years, and then we finished them in in Spanish uh, Oloroso barrels. So um, from from Jerez in in Spain and. After three years in the bourbon, it's fine. It's a single grain, so it's 90% um, corn, 10% malted barley. Um, it's nice. It's fine. It's a young whiskey. But the, the, the second barrel, the, the Oloroso, really, really rounds it out and finishes it lovely. It's smooth. It's, it's creamy. Uh, beautiful, as I call it, Christmas cake, Christmas pudding type notes of uh, um, sultanas, cherries, raisins. Really, 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 really good. And figs. Uh, delicious so that that'll be our best selling whiskey globally it's you know a pretty decent price point which is about 35 euros 30 dollars to 35 dollars um amazing straight on ice but mixes brilliantly so it sells very well for 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 it, it goes really well in cocktails we've, we've a lovely little cocktail cookbook and has um, won a lot of awards has won as a well huge amount yeah. of awards yeah absolutely so so yeah very versatile mm-hmm. can play with it boiler maker straight cocktail you have you know it, it's great and it's it's like the craft trade up from a jamison i should say our whiskies they're all single grain or single malt or our new our own whiskey is going to be um uh, pot still we don't blend we certainly haven't blended yet so we're quite quite traditional that way so we look back you know 100 or so years where, where so many different irish whiskies and we we want to sort of rejuvenate that we have and we've we, we very much admire the tradition of irish whiskey and the way it was made back then. And then we like to sort of, you know, tweak that or, or give a twist on that with the barrel finishes um, to make it, you know, it's, it's we're, we're, you know, we're innovating while staying true to the past, if you know what I mean. So, so what I mean, so back then there were single grains, there were, there were, there were pot stills, there were single malts. They didn't tend to blend. Uh, so that's why uh, we don't. Um, Hope that makes sense. Yeah, it? yeah, kind yeah. of as you say in your branding, the nineteenth century approach. Yeah, twenty yeah, first yeah. century. What sensibility? Exactly, are, uh-huh. exactly. That's that's. Uh, now, who was tasting these? Did you had you hired a um, a we, distiller or I mean? A, yeah, so we 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 <clears throat> excuse me. We got um we got some help from uh, an old distiller friend of ours who's still helping us. Um, and um yeah still helping us to this day 
uh, the two new stills uh, you saw coming in here, I don't know if Rowdy points them out, but they're literally just just being put in there, and and, and he's helping us with those. Uh, right and did now. you ha- was it diplomat? Oh, should I say democratic? Did oh, yeah. you all have to agree that Absolutely. this was going to? <laughs> we do lots of tastings. It's it's some people you know listening or two to this out of go, three, whatever you know, three out of four. Should I say not just yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. or how does that work? Yeah, like, for the next thing that you do, the crate. Yeah, like we're literally just finished that with our rose gin, so. Huh. And that went on for three months. Mm-hmm. Tweaks, nuances. Can it be that, you know, three out of you don't like it? And then yeah. <laughs> oh, there's just, we, we do like blind tastings and it's all rated. And, uh, you know, and people are like, tell me what it is. What's that? What's the influence there? Nope. And the, the distiller is sure. rowdy huge. Won't, won't, won't tell us. Um, so it is democratic. Okay. It's, it's terror is an understatement. We're absolute perfectionists. And if it's not amazing, it, we just don't make it mm-hmm. so much so actually there's a we've, we've released a single cast series last year um so the calvados finish a burgundy finish and a madeira finish we also had a riesling finish uh that we have decided not to go with because it didn't turn out well so mm-hmm. we, we'll experiment we'll try we'll innovate but if it's not right it doesn't hit the shelf you know so we're we're we're, we're, we're pretty particular uh, in terms of the liquid and its quality, but yeah, it's democratic. Um, doesn't exactly come to uh, fisticuffs, but uh, you know we'll have robust discussions uh, around uh, around the liquid and what's good and what's not. It's a lot of fun, though. You know, it's a lot of fun. I'm sure. Um, yeah, now, yeah. the first time I was introduced to you was through your gin. Mm-hmm. So describe how you came up with the first gin because you have you have several now. Yeah. Yeah, so I suppose we've two hero gins now, which are up front here, the Wild Botanical and the Rose, but I'll, I'll get to them in a sec. So back in 2014, it was, um, we decided, okay, we really want to make gin. The gin craze, okay, it was sort of happening in London, but it hadn't happened over here. Um, uh, so over in Ireland, you could get Cork Dry Gin, you could get Gordon's Gin, and that was pretty much it. A gin and tonic was very much back then seen as sort of like a golf club type, maybe older parents, your parents That's were crazy. drinking gin. Even so late. Yeah, really. yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Look, it really was. And um but we you know, we we, we had this beautiful still and uh we live in the Garden of Ireland. Um which is I sorry, Wicklow is known yes, as the Garden you're of all Ireland. Wicklow boys, yeah. yeah. And uh <laughs> so it's good it's interesting actually. I, I one Saturday, I'll never forget it, I still have the paper. I was reading the Irish Times magazine. I was flicking through and I saw this article on Wicklow Wild Foods and this girl called Geraldine Kavna who runs Wicklow Wild Foods. And what she does on weekends is take people out foraging. They forage in the hills, the valleys, the rivers, around by the sea. And then she'll end, she'll take them and she'll end up at the end of the day, like in a beautiful meadow or a forest, pulls out these tables, rustic tablecloths, and she lays out the whole meal there in front of them that they've picked. And she'll, she'll, she'll like quickly make up a, a really beautiful wild meal with... With, with, with syrups and all sorts to drink. And, and, and I was reading this going, oh my God, this is amazing. We have to talk to Geraldine because could you imagine if we can do something with our gin? So that was a Saturday. We rang her on the Monday and, and she said, come, sure, come out foraging with me next Saturday and let's talk. So we did. And our beautiful plan was hatched. We said to Geraldine, look, can we use some of these amazing Wicklow botanicals in a gin? And she said, yeah, of course you could. That's a great idea. Um, uh, and then she came back in a couple of minutes past. She said, but you know, those botanicals will change as the seasons change. So what you get in spring is going to be different from summer, autumn and winter. And You're like, yes. My marketing brain went into, <laughs> uh, well, not just marketing, but also oh, just, yeah. you know, in, it's interesting. Wow. Okay. Gin that changes as the seasons change. Mm-hmm. Amazing. So in 2014, we made our very first batch with Geraldine of summer gin and botanicals picked in the summer. So the base is what you'd expect in most gins, juniper, coriander, angelica root. But then outside of those sort of base ingredients, we will put in anywhere between 15 to 30 seasonal ingredients. So for about guts of two years, we did summer, we did spring, we did spring summer, autumn. We started with summer. And then the, f- the next year, we did a full season. So we did spring, summer, autumn, winter in 2015, 2016. And they were going down like... Yeah, they were going down extremely well. We're winning awards left, right, and center. People and the gin craze was catching on, and people really appreciated them. And uh, bartenders and gin aficionados uh, really, really did 
dig them and people might have their favorite one or a lot of people collected the four and uh the four different seasons and they are particularly you know they are quite different actually do, do you want to taste while, while we'll we taste talk? in a okay, sec in a sec Let's okay so I'll t- okay so we'll talk about the, the tasting notes back then but you know very very different gins so great brilliant success everything the only couple of little issues not issues but uh, bartenders might say okay great i have the spring gin on my uh, cocktail menu um, you know it's printed love it and then they ring up to get some more spring gin and, and we're like oh really sorry it's summer now and we're all out we're all out of spring gin because so you're at the beck and call of the seasons like I'd literally get a text from Geraldine and say uh, spring's over summer's here because something is now in bloom right. so she now can't pick the, the ingredients to go into the spring gin so we have to switch to summer which is sort of cool but not cool if you have a menu printed and stuff like that also retailers weren't really digging four different barcodes they they were you know on the four different uh skews they just saw it as a glendalock gin so that was slightly a bit of an issue um so people saying, oh, don't also i was going to say that you can always control what is spring because you don't know what's going to grow next spring because it's all dependent Absolutely. on the weather yeah yeah so your spring gin this year is going to be different completely from, different from yeah. the spring gin next like if it's year. a really hot summer right it'll taste different mm-hmm. uh, if it's really rainy in the autumn or whatever you're not going to get those autumnal lovely fruits maybe as, as much as you, you would if it was really really sunny so now, that was sort of a thing that was people liked that in one way that they it changed you know you, you never you never know what you're going to get but you know from a if you want to go sort of bigger with this mm-hmm. and not just small and artisanal all the time you know yeah you have to think a little bit differently so our seasonal gins have never gone away still here we're looking at them right now they're they're they're, they're fantastic but we decided then towards the end of 2016, I think, I think it was, and it did take us a long time and lots of tastings and lots of arguments <laughs> to get to the recipe. But we want to develop an all-year range in, a wild botanical gin. Okay. So that's what, we've, that, that's what we've done. And so it's, it's what we had to do is go out in spring, summer, to so the four different seasons, and with Geraldine and Rowdy, our distiller, pick botanicals that in our heads we're thinking okay is that going to go with this botanical from summer and this botanical from winter and this botanical from from autumn obviously you can't go out and pick those botanicals at any one time so that was sort of like the the beauty of of uh or sorry just just geraldine and and, and rowdy their 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 skill set their palette their their interest and and their knowledge of what grows naturally and all that so geraldine had a recipe in her head that she, so she went so what we do is in, in springtime make a gin with it's really heavy with the botanicals that she thinks will go with summer, mm-hmm. autumn, winter. And then at the end of the year, we blended them all together to make our wild botanical gin. So there's a lot involved yeah. in, in, in making this gin. Um, but we cracked it. We, we, you know, after, after pretty much nine months, nine to ten months of experimentation, we came up with the recipe. And uh, it has been a huge, huge success. It's now on sale in 42 countries and wildly successful uh, and it's a beautiful gin and we also dropped the price point because we knew we said okay we're on to a winner here while the seasonal gins are about 45 euro maybe that's around the same in dollars this is 35 and um, so it's more of an everyday gin it's a very mixable gin as well it goes great with the tonic while the other the the the, the uh the the uh seasonal gins no problem drinking them straight because they're so flavorful and so you know there's lots going on where the wild botanical it, it tastes incredibly good. And of course, you can drink it straight, but it's it was pretty much designed for a and T. Mm-hmm. Um, Rowdy and, and Geraldine will probably give out to me for saying that because they will only ever put maybe a drop of water or soda water in it because to really release the botanicals. Yeah, so it's whatever your whatever your gig is, whatever you're into. But yeah, I, I love it with a with, with, with a tonic. So so that's that's pretty much where the, the wild botanical gin came from, and that's our absolute best selling gin. It's been out for almost two years now. Very recently, so last night I was telling you I was at a I was at a uh, an event where we, we we were tasting our rose gin to um, we were celebrating International Women's Day uh, with the Kings Inn, so all the barristers, all the female barristers in Ireland. Um, but we last year um, we decided to come out with a rose gin. Our our our, our Rowdy, your, your, you met Rowdy, our distiller. Um, his mom has a beautiful rose garden that's very 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 uh uh well uh, maintained and very precious to to, to rowdy's mom and he was just experimenting on his own and he came out with this amazing summer gin that had been infused with roses and distilled with roses as well and we all tasted like wow that is stunning that is an amazing gin. let's let's do something with this so again it 
took months to come up with the final, final recipe, but we cracked it about six weeks ago and uh, very recently bottled. And uh, it's going down an absolute storm. So beautiful pink hue made with three different roses. You can see them there in the front. So wild roses, heritage roses and damask roses distilled in the, in the pot as well as infused afterwards to get that beautiful color, that lovely pink color. Soft, delicate, really floral, Turkish delight. Oh, it's amazing. Absolutely gorgeous. So, so right now, and it's the same price point as our Wild Botanical, about 35 euro, 30, 30, $35. There are two hero gins. There are two lead gins. The seasonals are speciality. And to be honest, if we let Rowdy and Geraldine away with it, they would make a different gin every day of the of the week. And I'm, I actually, I'm not messing. So you can also see we've got slow gin. We've got wild blackberry and mountain heather gin. We've got beech leaf gin. We're all out of our dillisk gin, which is a seaweed gin. Um, and, and this is a lovely gin we made with uh, Clodagh McKenna uh, earlier, a couple of months ago. Clodagh is a, a chef, um, a celebrity chef. She's on lots of programs, actually, in the UK. Uh, we made a gin with her. So, honestly, the guys would make a different gin every day, as I said. But so we sort of have to row back and go, okay, their speciality, their, 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 you know, their small batch, and okay, we'll, we'll do them whenever we have time. But our heroes, the ones that are selling really well and, 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 and uh, taste amazing, are the Wild Botanical. So what are your plans for the future? Are you thinking of new things? Or do you want to have a new space? Um, so you know, from a liquid point of view, like you're looking at the table here, and how many, it's a lot. How many it's SKUs a lot. are we looking at? There's too many. So we joke amongst ourselves. No, it's a sort of a serious joke. And we said, right, 2019, no NPD. Um, <laughs> what you know, is NPD? New, sorry, new product development. Oh, no, no, just, no, let's, no, let's, let's, let's just, just enjoy let's what enjoy you have, what we have. Sit back. Yeah. And drink some of this. In saying that, we're about to. It's hard because you're creative people, so you always want to start creating yeah, more things. It's who know? we are. It's part of who we uh-huh. are. So, but in, like in saying, there's no new product film. That's as in that we work on this year to maybe release next year. We do have some lovely new things being released. Um, so you can see on the bar here, there's a 17 year old single malt, uh, finished in Mizunara barrels, so really rare Japanese barrels, and a 25 year old single malt. That was in bourbon and then sherry. And now we finished it in virgin Wicklow oak, which is a whole oh, other story. Mm-hmm. So are you, are you good for us to, to talk? Yes, to, yes, talk, do. To sw- swap to our the, 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 the whiskey chapter. Um, so we talked about double barrel, single grain. We also have a seven-year-old uh, single malt and a 13-year-old single malt. The barrels that we finish them in, again, have to stand apart. They have to be really special. So the seven-year-olds, the City of Seven Churches, that one, we finish that in Black Pitts Porter barrels. So Black Pitts Porter is a beautiful craft porter beer made by the Five Lamps Dublin Brewery. Uh, Brian Fagan, who's one of our directors and founder, he um, started up the Five Lamps Dublin Brewery as well. And myself and Kevin did the uh, the the marketing and the the, 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 the brand for, for that too. But they make this amazing porter and we gave them some old whiskey barrels and they put their porter into those barrels for six, I think six to eight months. And then we released a, um, a, a barrel aged porter, which was amazing, gorgeous, won lots of awards. It tasted so good and it just, it just, it just worked so well together. We said, okay, let's, let, let's take those barrels back and we put our seven-year-old into those barrels and left it there for nine months and um it's just sublime uh it's your coffee cocoa chocolate notes amazing it's a beautiful beautiful uh, uh single single malt it's almost gone uh, we've our last bottling later this month and when it's gone it's gone unfortunately it'll be missed and then we have our 13 year old single malt um this uh, before we put it into Miss Nara, won Best Irish Whiskey at the San Francisco uh, International Spirits Awards. It's pretty much the Oscars of, 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 of the drinks world. Um, so amazing liquid. But we wanted to put a second finish on it. We wanted to you know, our, 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 put it into a, a second barrel. But because it was such a precious whiskey that won this amazing award, um, we had to make sure that the, the barrel we put it into it was outstanding yeah super special yeah so we we did our research and there's some lovely scotches that are that are finished in mizunara so um barrels so mizunara is a really rare japanese oak 
has to be over 200 years before you can cut it down. It doesn't grow that straight, so to get nice straight staves is quite difficult. Uh, it's been overused in Japan because J- Japanese whiskey's been doing so well lately. This is really hard to get. Uh, we went to the last independent cooperage. Kevin, our craft director, went down and picked the barrels. They only make 40 a year, and we got 13 of them two okay. years ago. Uh-huh. Uh, and then we got an- another 15 or so this year. But we, we put that beautiful award-winning Best Irish Whiskey Liquid into these barrels. Slightly nervous because, you know, we're messing with something really good here. My God, the result. How long was, un- was it in unreal. the barrel? It's a very porous barrel. So uh-huh. some were just six months up to eight months. Really, so somewhere between six short. to eight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When I say porous, they're like, it, it, the, the barrels, so a bourbon barrel will cost us about 200 euro. These barrels cost us 3,000 euro each. Their version haven't been used before, but they come with this like lacquer, this 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 resinous paint that you have to paint onto the barrel to stop them from leaking because they're so porous. So they pick up flavor really, really quickly. But the flavor, I had literally never tasted anything like it. So coconut, sandalwood, um, tropical, a whole different mouthfeel. And then it, for whatever reason, this amazing chocolate hit. It quite will taste it now in a sec. It, it's quite exceptional. So Jim Murray, who writes the Whiskey Bible, he's only ever given whiskey a 97 out of 100, so never got more than that. This got 96 out of 100. He called it, it was liquid gold status. I think that the, the, um, the statement he made in the Whiskey Bible is something along the lines of sumptuous and gorgeous, the, the biggest chocolate hit of any Irish whiskey in the history of Irish whiskey or something like this. Some, some amazing quote. Um, so... And then, well, yeah, just before Christmas, the Whiskey Advocate named it in the top uh, 20 whiskies in the world. So it's exceptional, exceptional, exceptional whiskey. So, so, but unfortunately, the 13 will eventually run out as well. We have a little bit more than that than we do the seven-year-olds. So later this year, we are um, launching a 17-year-old. Actually, I'm heading over to Dusseldorf next weekend to launch this over in Provine. Um, so we're launching that. It'll come out come at a bigger price tag because uh, it's 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 uh, older um it's incredible like the depth of flavor has just increased um even more so from the 13 year old um so yeah so that's what we're launching later this year and then just beside it there 25 year old again amazing beautiful single malt that's been aged for for 25 years um so this is the interesting not that everything i haven't talked about is very interesting <laughs> but this is really interesting so It's been 25 years in two different casks, but to give it a little bit of life before we release it, we've put it into virgin Irish oak, not just Irish oak, Wicklow oak. So last year, no, year before last, we went out to um, an oak wood, which about five miles or so from here, um, called Jack's Wood. And we picked um, 14, 14 oak trees um that were suitable for 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 staves and uh we cut them down for everyone i always feel bad saying that but for everyone we cut down we planted seven saplings um so it's it's a managed forest um and and the wood or the oak is going is is is, is going to be used well um so we cut down uh, those trees they were um they were sent then to Spain. The wood was sent to Spain, but all numbered. So tree number one, all that, all those planks were uh, were put together in, in one pallet. Tree number two, tree number three, so all numbered and, and labelled. They were um, seasoned over in Spain, uh, coopered over in Spain, and we got them back last year, sort of late last year. And we have put the 25-year-old in them just to give it a, a lease of life and the freshness. It's virgin Wicklow oak. Mm. So again, it's putting our stamp on it. Um, it's from a place it's from Wicklow it's from where we're from so it's unique to us um, so that's that's really really interesting and at a nearly at another level uh, our pot still whiskey that we've made ourselves um, so not sourced from 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 from, uh, from Cooley um, that has been released in June July this year again we're launching that in Provine next weekend um, so that's our liquid uh, aged in bourbon for just over three years and then finished for up to six months in this same virgin Wicklow oak. So uh, the bottles will be numbered. Um, it'll say from what tree it came, um, what cask, what bottle number. So very much personalized. 
and uh, we're very much looking forward to that. And it's like it's a, just over three; it's about just under four years old. The liquid, but it is in, insane. It's so good. Uh, and again, unique to us, it's unique to where we're from. You can tell from our gin story. You know, we're about our liquid is about a, a time and a place. It's very much it can only come from here, from Wicklow. Now that'll be the same with our pot still. You know, which is which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, well, that's... I think you've made me super thirsty now. <laughs> I've got to try some of these things. Should we go have a drink? Yeah, let's have a drink. Absolutely, let's have a drink. Thanks so much to Gary for meeting me on a cold, rainy day in the wilds of Wicklow, and introducing me to every expression of every spirit they make. I so love the idea of the seasonal gins using only what was gathered in the Wicklow forests. I wanted to include Gary's descriptions for you as we walk through the seasons, beginning with spring. Um, so I'm trying spring. Mm-hmm. So what should I, what should we experience? Okay, so if you give it a little bit of a nose. So I get greens, I get a lot of freshness. So if you think about what botanicals go into this, it's literally winter has just ended and, and things have just started to grow again. So most things that grow are nice and green and vibrant and fresh um, so there's a lot of greens but there's also I don't know if you know of gorse flower a beautiful uh, yellow flower it's everywhere in Wicklow like come springtime it's just and the beautiful smell of coconut especially on a summer's day when the pollen is high you walk through the fields and you just this beautiful smell of gorse so there's a lot of a huge amount of gorse flower in this and poor Geraldine her fingers are in tatters after after a good day's picking because uh, it's quite a prickly uh, bush um but uh so yeah on, so on the nose i get lots of greens on on the uh on, on the palate i certainly will pick up the the gorse flower that sort of coconut taste um so yeah a fresh green mm. uh vibrant gin yeah so not i wouldn't say that sweet so the sweetness you'll get sweetness in summer and you get sweetness in autumn then it's more spicy in winter this is more sort of fresh and green it's lively um is how i sort of describe it so the summer on the nose versus the spring, there's a lot more flowers. It's a lot more floral. It's 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 um, where spring is nice and green and fresh. This is more floral. It's sweeter. It's more delicate, but it's you know it it's definitely yeah that those sweet 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 uh, it's much sweeter on the palate. Not without being overly sweet or sickly sweet. It's very naturally sweet, but there's a lot of petals going into this there's a lot of different type of petals a huge amount of elderflower like massive amounts of elderflower and um, so you'll definitely pick that up in the taste and the palate um slightly slightly uh spicy finish but not overly so but yeah more of a summery f- summery fresh floral gin so this is the autumn gin um the autumn we put in lots of fruit so lots, lots of autumnal fruit so on the nose it's a softer nose. There's there's definitely fruit. It's fruitier where summer is floral, winter is green. So you get those. It's very fruity. Again, on the palate, there's a sweetness, but it's a different type of sweetness. It's an autumnal sweetness. Big, big um, botanical that we put into this. Lots of it is a thing called a frocken berry. <laughs> that I've frocken, never heard of. A frocken berry is basically a blueberry or a bilberry. It's a wild blueberry. Um, and uh, they 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 grow everywhere in Wicklow. Uh, the deers love them. The deer love them, and uh, they're beautiful, lovely sweet blueberry. So there's lots of that in 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 this. There's rose hips. There's crab apples. There's th- those nice autumnal fruits that are growing on the hedgerows uh, around around autumn. So yeah, it's it's much fruitier, um, but it's subtle again. All our all all our gins are quite you know, you know there's a subtlety to them. But there's also layers. There's lots of layers of the you know, the various botanicals coming through. So I have a great story. Um, Geraldine and myself were over in London two years ago. And there was a cocktail competition on. It was a gin cocktail competition. And the bartenders could use any of our gins. And myself and Geraldine had done about seven or eight trade visits in the morning. We're pretty tired. We got to the venue just after lunchtime. We were tired. We were hungry. We needed to sit down and recharge before the event. We had two events that night. And Geraldine must have been, on, 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 I kid you not, she must have been about 10 meters away from uh, a bartender who was mixing up some drinks. And she was like a dog smelling sausages. She was, and she said, I smell our autumn gin. And turned around 
10, 10 yards away, 10 meters away, went up and there he was mixing an autumn gin. So the, 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 the nose of these gins are, you know, they're quite unique. They're, you know, especially when Geraldine's incredible, her palate and her, her, her is, is, is amazing. Um, but yeah, the, the, I think the smells are, are really important. It's a really important part of our gins, you know, so. Okay, so this is our winter gin and our spiciest gin. So not huge amount grows at winter, you know. Um, a lot of you know we the, the big botanical, the wild botanical we put in this are slow berries, um, but then we put a lot of fir and Scots pine, you know, like Christmas trees basically. So there's a and, and we do put a few spices in. What Geraldine wanted and Rowdy wanted to create was a a a gin that just brought you, you know, you could sit by the fire at Christmas time, you know, that type of warming. Uh, spicy gin that sort of brings you back to to to, to sort of Christmas time. So this quite a, you know it's quite interesting that most bartenders this would be their favorite gin to play with. And um, that cocktail competition I was telling you about when I was talking about the smell uh, with Geraldine over in London, the the co- the gin that won that cocktail competition was the winter gin, and it was actually mis- uh, mixed with fernet. Uh, I can still taste it to this day, and that was over two years ago. It, amazing! It's an amazing combination of flavors and tastes. So, um, so yeah, this gin, lots of spice, um, it's warming, uh, you know, it is quite juniper forward as well, but there's a spiciness that you wouldn't normally get in a gin. It's quite, um, uh, you know, up, uh, you know, it's quite uh, apparent and, uh, yeah, really interesting. Since summertime has finally arrived, well, according to the clock, that is, I thought our cocktail of the week should reflect this season ahead. Our cocktail of the week is a whiskey cocktail called Galway in Spring, and it was created by Jonathan Kahn for the Jay Parker in Chicago. But you can easily make this one at home. The ingredients are one and a half ounces of Glendalock double barrel, a quarter ounce of chartreuse green, a quarter ounce of mint syrup, and 0.5 ounces of lemon juice, plus a splash of soda water and a mint sprig. Measure out all the ingredients and pour into a shaker. Add ice and shake vigorously for 8 to 10 seconds. Strain through a Hawthorne strainer, which you can find on my site, into a tall glass. Add fresh ice and top with that soda water. Then add the fresh mint sprig for garnish. Slancha. You'll find this recipe and all the cocktails of the week at alushlifemanual.com, where you'll also find all the ingredients in our shop. We're back to Kentucky next time for a lush tour of Maker's Mark. You'll feel as if you're there taking the tour with me, because you will be. Before running off, remember to head to alushlifemanual.com backslash merch. For all your lush life gifts. Until next time, bottoms up. Thanks for listening to the Lush Life Podcast. For more information and links to everything you've heard, plus a whole lot more, please visit a lushlifemanual.com. Always remember the wise words of Oscar Wilde all things in moderation, including moderation. And always drink responsibly. Okay, I said that last part. The music is by Stephen Shapiro and used with permission. Lush Life is produced by Evo Terra. And I'm your drinking partner, Susan Schwartz. I'll see you at the bar.